Question three, how do you manage weeds in your garden? Again, you can uh, choose more than one. Leah, can you make sure it's recording? I forgot to turn it on late. Can you see that? Yes, we are recording. This. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody in the background there must have seen, press the button. All right, hand pulling, hand tools, pulling out in front. Again, we're going low, low tech on these. I like it. All right, is that the last question, Frank? Yes, that is it. All right, thank you all for um, weighing in on the poll. It helps us as we uh, direct our um, comments and um, remarks. So we'll. Um, in. All right, Candy, take it away. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so quick review as we get started here. What are the four basic things plants need to, to thrive? That'd be sunlight, air, nutrients, and water. And we've talked about the first three over the first couple sessions. I'm going to talk a little bit about water. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so watering, do you need to water? Well, yeah, in the, in the summer around here, it gets very dry, right? We can actually go six, maybe even eight weeks without watering or without a substantial amount of rain. So you really do need to water around here. Um, and what, how you wanna water really is deeply and infrequently. And we'll talk more about what that, what that means. But in general, if you've, are planting your garden in the ground. Uh, containers are a little bit different and I'll talk about container plants in a little bit. But um, gardens in the ground or a raised bed that's just slightly raised, in general, that usually means two or three times a week, a really good, good soaking. Um, but it can depend on an awful lot of different factors, the soil type, the location, the plants themselves. And Mother Nature, what's it like outside, right? Is it, is it kind of like today, it's a little bit sunny, but cool? Is it moist? Is it 95 and screaming winds that are really hot? Those all make a huge impact. So we'll, we'll again, we'll dig into each one of these a little bit more as we go through this. Um, but the first thing we're going to talk about um, is that soil type. So the type of soil does make an impact on how not only how often you have to water, but really it's because of how well does the soil hold the water itself. Um, there's three basic types of soil, sandy soil, clay soil, and then loamy soil. So sandy soil, water really doesn't retain much or the soil doesn't retain a lot of water. Um, the particles are really small. So think about at the beach, you're at the beach, the tides come in, the water funnels through that really quickly, right? On the other end of the spectrum, clay soil. If you've got clay in your backyard this time of year, previous weeks, months, you would know it, right? It really holds water. You go try to dig this time of year and it's gonna have a lot of water um, held in it. And then the loamy soil is really a good mixture of those two. It, it retains the, the water very well, but not so well that it'll, it'll rot out your plants. Um, and, and last week we talked about adding items to your soil, what makes a good soil. There was talk about um, potting soil and how to make that and why it's important to invest in good soil. And a lot of that ties into that, that water retention itself. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so how do you check if you need to water, right? You, you, you think that it might be time to water, but, but how do you really tell? Looking at the top layer of soil really is not a good indication if you need to water or not. What you need to do is stick your finger down into the soil an inch or two and see if it's moist down in there. And if it is, then you're probably good to go. But if it's dry an inch, one inch, two inches down into the soil, then it's time for a good soaking. And the picture down in the bottom right hand corner here is actually of a plant that's wilting. It's, it's time to water that one. What you don't want is for your plants to look like that. Hopefully you're watering them more frequently, frequently enough that they're not wilting. 
So some common watering problems that you might experience throughout the season. One can actually be watering too much. You wouldn't think overwatering can be a problem, but it can, um, in part depending on the type of soil, how whole, well it holds the water, but also a lot of plants just don't wanna sit in really, really drenched water. They, they wanna dry out a little bit. If you've ever had house plants, um, a lot of them, that's a good indication. That's what I'm talking about. They don't like to sit there and wet every single day. They get unhappy. So not only is it not good for your plants, but quite honestly, it's just a waste of water and it causes your nutrients to leach away much faster than if you're just watering when you need to. And, and in really extreme conditions, it also can create a moldy environment because your plants are just too wet all the time. Another common problem is frequent and shallow watering. So I talked about watering really deeply and there's a reason you wanna do that. Um, so on the right hand side here, we have a picture of a plant that is watered quite frequently and has a really shallow root system on the bottom right hand corner. But on the left hand side is a good healthy plant with a deep root system. And the reason for that is that we talked about, I mentioned letting the soil dry out at the top. If you're watering really deeply and the water's down three, four or five inches, as it starts to dry out at the top layers, the roots are actually gonna be searching for that moisture and they're gonna be pushing down deeper into the soil. Whereas if you're watering on a really regular basis every day, the water's sitting up at the surface and the plants are literally gonna build their root structure like is shown there on the right. And they're just gonna be hanging out at the top. And then you get a spell where you're gone for a couple of days or it gets super hot and it dries out. They're impacted much faster um, by you losing that that's water mass at the top inch or two. Next slide. Oh, I did not realize this one passed through. Let's just show all of them. Okay, so watering methods, we did a survey, right? And, and most of you said you'd be hand watering, um, but let's talk a little bit about each of these types of watering. Um, so we've got a couple pictures here of, of hand watering, whether you're using um, a container or a hose, you know, it's quick. It, it's not quick, it's easy. It, it's ex inexpensive to get the materials to do that, but it does take a fair amount of time, especially when you really think about you want to go around and, and water really deeply. That can take a fair amount of time, but it is by far the, the least expensive investment that you've got. And then there's drip irrigation. A couple people said that they're gonna consider drip irrigation. Um, that's really great. It gets right to where the plants actually need the water at the roots themselves. Um, you can determine exactly how long you're gonna water. So that is really helpfully and do that for a longer period of time, but it is a higher cost investment. And I can tell you from experience, if you're putting in a drip irrigation system, it takes time to put that in. Even if it's just for one raised bed, I can't tell you how many plants I have gotten excited and bought and put in the ground and then a warm spell comes and I didn't get a sprinkler system set up or I didn't hand water them frequent enough. So if you're putting in drip, think about planning ahead, building, getting that put together. And then the last one is overhead sprinklers. Again, pretty low investment, right? You can go get them at, at Bymart or the Home Depot or any location um, pretty easily. They're easy to set up not that expensive. There is higher evaporation with those um, or, or higher water waste. Uh, that should say water waste there because they will, especially in the heat of the day, it'll evaporate. So if you are using sprinklers, I would recommend early in the morning, late at night, um, not in the heat of the day so that you're not um, having as much water evaporate into the air. Next slide. So different plants need, have different needs. Um, let's go ahead and pop through. There we go. So depending on the type of plant it is or how old it is can impact how often you need to water. Um, seedlings, they're the, the most delicate in terms of um, their root structure, right? We watched a video last week 
um, of Lynn planting and she showed those roots and there's not a real big root structure when you're planting, planting the young plants. Um, so they need to be kept really moist. And of course, seeds, if you're planting directly in, same thing, they need to be kept moist to germinate and, and get those root structures developed. Growing plants, as they start to establish themselves, you don't need to water them as often. Um, and that's when you really do want to water them, get the water really um, deep down in there. And this, this talks here, the note says six inches. So one way would to check that if you're not sure how long that will take is you could actually take some of your soil and put it in a pot, um, a yogurt container, a, a, a planter container, five gallon pot or something. And however you're watering your garden, you could, you could also water that and see how long it takes to really get the water um, soaked into that container. And that might be a good indication. And then the types of plants that they are, um, and their root structures may pay an impact on how long and how frequently you need to water as well. Um, some examples of shallow rooted plants, think of an onion, if you ever have grown an onion or seen the root structure of an onion, they're not very long, they're just a couple inches. Whereas a tomato, that would be an example of a, a deep rooted plant. Um, again, we looked at, watched the planting video last week and you know, if you saw that, it was planted in the ground to even start with a good six or eight inches, and then it'll grow even further down in. So the type of plant, the type of root structure is gonna play an impact on how frequently you need to water. So let's talk about containers for a minute because they are a little bit different when I say water a couple times a week. That All those rules go out the door when you're talking about containers. Um, they dry out much faster. I really would recommend you checking your containers every single day. And even throughout the growing season, not only the temperature will impact how often you need to water, but the plants and how old they are will, will as well. Um, the early ones, when they're young, talked about, you know, a shallow root structure, not a very good root structure. You need to water them a lot. But I also find then at the end of the season, when I've got plants that have a lot of roots, they'll suck up water really fast too. So for me, my pots, I actually um, end up having to water them most of the time in August, twice a day. They get a lot of sun. So keep an eye on those and, and make sure you're watering them very frequently. So I think that that might actually be, oh, no, we got one more slide here. So I, I saw this in the slide deck as I was putting this together and thought this was a, a great um, example here of, putting together a watering can that isn't very expensive, right? You buy a gallon of milk at the grocery store, you can actually convert it. And if you've got kids that like to garden, this would be a great way to get them all their own containers. Just save that milk carton, clean it out, um, get a, a pair of scissors or something that um, you can poke the top with and poke some holes in and, and create all the kids their own little watering cans. Okay, so does anybody have questions on watering? Carol, do we have any questions that come up, came up in the chat? Yeah, the questions that have been, have been um, well, about when do you need to start watering? And I referred to your comment about paying attention to the soil, signals from the soil, what's going on with the weather and such, but then remembering also if people are planting seeds or transplants, there may be more need for watering. Um, and I think you covered that pretty well in terms of keeping the soil moist for seeds and, and such. So um, if anybody is confused by my back and forth there, please don't hesitate to ask another question. You could even unmute here if you think you want to. There is one question from TK says, what do you think about composting garden beds and um, TK, I'm just gonna say right now that we'll get to that question um, since it doesn't sound like it's directly related to watering. Okay, we were talking about composting and mulches in just a minute. In fact. Yeah, that's what I thought, very good. And I think when people, when I see like the number one failure I see happen in new gardens is people who have this beautiful garden and they have a way to water it and then they don't have a way to water when they go on vacation. <laughs> because if you're using hand watering as your main system, 
then, um, then, and you're investing a whole bunch of time every day out there with your, with your watering, sometimes it can be hard to find someone else to come in and take care of that for you. So if you can find a, a gardening friend and make a pact to take care of each other's gardens while you're gone, um, it can make a big difference in having some garden success. Um, and the drip irrigation with a timer can also take care of that, but it is a bigger investment of setup time and of money. I agree with you completely. I will tell you the first few years I, when I moved to a new house and we gardened, I did not have an automatic sprinkler system. And I'll tell you, we didn't go on vacation in the summer because <laughs> I was nervous to leave for very long or have the teenage kids, you know, in the neighborhood water. So yeah, if you've put all that time and effort into it, make sure you've, you've got a system that'll work or some, some buddies that will help. I'm nothing worse than coming home and finding out your plants are dead because you went on vacation. So, so I have made a counting chart. Like when I'm hand watering, I'll count how many seconds. I mean, if I have to turn over my garden to somebody else and I'll say, can you come over and water these, this area here? And I'll say, please stand here for 60 seconds <laughs> and actually count it out. And it seems like forever if you're not used to watering. So, um, and doing the test and coming back, you know, after you've watered what you think is deeply, I come back and test it and put my finger in there or take a little trowel and make sure how deep that got because it's surprising how, how long it takes to really saturate. And especially when the water or within the soil has dried out, yes. right? So you can water a container is again a really good example. You can water a big container. If the soil has gotten completely dry, it'll start dripping through there after a while, but it actually, the soil hasn't reabsorbed some of the water and it, it can take a while for that to reabsorb. So you dry things out, you've got to really soak it even longer than you would if you're maintaining it on a regular basis. Good points. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk about protecting young plants. So we talked a little bit about this, I think Linda, just a little bit when she was planting some of the plants in the video last week. Um, I wanna first talk about hardening off plants. So it's really important for you to understand if a plant is, is really ready to be put outside overnight. So if you are growing, starting seeds inside your house, for example, and they're used to being in 65, 70 degree weather all the time, and you're gonna move them outside one day, they're gonna get shocked. Just like we get shocked when all of a sudden it's nice outside and 70 the first time, and we think it's just as hot as can be, and it's really not. The plants get shocked by the temperature swings, hot and cold at night, as well as the UV rays, the sun. Um, and so it's not just if you've been planting seeds in your house, but it also can depend on where you're buying them from. You know, Bymart, I see they keep them out all night. They're probably acclimated to the cold weather at night, but the master gardener cell, they're, they're not acclimated. They're, they've been in a greenhouse. Maybe they've, they've had a little bit of a temperature swing, but they're not really ready for the 50 degree weather we might get at night. So if, if you've got plants in that situation, what you want to do is slowly acclimate them to the temperature swing to the changes of being outside. And so I personally, I'll, I'll take them and I'll start putting them outside for an hour or two one day. And then over the week, I'll have them be outside a little bit longer every single day in sun and shade and get them used to that. And then the last night before I put them out, maybe even two nights, I might put them by the back door. Um, that's not going to be as cold as putting them in the garden, but it, it's pretty close, a couple degrees warmer. So if, if you're bringing home transplants, make sure you read up on that and think about it. Because I, again, I've, I've learned the hard way and killed a few plants by not really thinking through what I was doing. Got so excited to get them into the garden. So you need to do the hardening off. In addition, um, as you're planting them, do think about the sun and wind. And there was an example last week of a, a piece of wood that was put up to block, a, I think that was a tomato plant from getting that hard sun. So there's things you can do to block that a little bit. 
Um, and then if you've got insects and bugs in your garden as well, you can protect them. And there's actually a couple photos here on the right hand side, there's a photo of two liter bottles that had the bottoms cut off and they're put over the plants and can protect them from the insects, but also provide just a couple degrees of um, additional warmth at night to protect them from that um, temperature swing. So why don't we talk a little bit about, let's go to the next slides and we'll talk about soil and we'll get to the, the compost um, comment or question I think that was made up. So mulch is one of my favorite things. Um, I actually use compost, three in one compost quite a bit, but um, I really like to put a layer of mulch down in the summer. It serves a lot of purposes. One, it will hold the moisture in a little bit better. So it's the first line of defense and what gets, gets beat down by the sun before the soil itself does. It also helps suppress weeds. Um, so I'll always plant my garden and then put, put four to six inches of, of compost down around the plants. Now this picture shows some hay, I think. Um, in and around the cabbage, that'll work, work as well as compost. And then you can also do something similar in the fall and put it down and that will help minimize the erosion and nutrient loss you might have from water um, pushing or you know, watering down on the soil. And at any point in either of those situations, when you're done with it, you can actually turn it over and then have it build into your soil to help create new healthy soil and bring some nutrients into the soil. Another option um, for mulching, let's go to the next slide, for adding some protection is um, a, a cover crop. So here we've got a picture of, of mulch on the left hand side and a cover crop there on the right hand side. So in the winter, you could plant a cover crop and that can serve a couple purposes. Again, it can help protect from soil erosion, um, it also can help build up some nutrients um, in your soil. And I think if we go to the next slide, it'll actually talk a little bit about cover crops. So cover crops are really something you don't do this time of year. You wanna plant them between August and October. There's a variety of different um, seeds that are available. I've done clover. I know that there's um, fava beans and some peas that can be put in the ground. Um, again, all small seeds that you lay on the ground and, and let it grow. Um, you can either take your whole garden out or you can actually start laying those seeds in and around your plants. So you've got you know, a few plants left in the garden in, in late summer, go ahead and start dropping in the cover crop seeds and let them start to grow up while you're still finishing your, your crops. Um, one thing you do want to do is get those cut or pulled out, depending on, on how you're getting rid of them in the spring. Um, again, that's a mistake I've made. I've done clover a couple times and oh, it's so pretty. It's this nice like burgundy red color. Yeah, once it does that, it's a lot harder to get out. So if you put a cover crop in, you want to you wanna cut that down, um, harvest it, so to speak, or turn it under before it goes to seed. And you, another option is also to then put it in a compost pile. So you can decompose the, pose it that way or turn it into your soil and then let it sit there for a week or two before you're gonna do any planting. I think, yep, that is the last of it. Um, any questions or anything any master gardeners wanna add about protecting plants and, and um, mulches? So I have another cover crop story. Um, in that picture, it had fava beans. First year I grew fava as a cover crop. I thought, oh, I'll let these mature and uh, harvest them as well. So we did that a couple of times and um, I am decided I'm not a huge fava bean fan. Unfortunately, in the adjacent tree, there was a nest of blue jays and those babies went crazy for the fava beans. And even after we took out that cover crop, the blue jays hung around all summer and just feasted on the garden. So yeah, definitely rip out your cover crops before they set flowers, set seeds and everything else because you're just asking for it. All right, Carol, were there any questions in the chat? 
No, you did such a nice job. There really weren't any questions. However, uh, we're looking forward to hearing about slugs later this evening. Okay. okay. I think Leo might, Leo might have some comments about slugs. Yep. All right. Uh, my not so favorite topic of weeding. Um, this is uh, our two pictures from the gardens that I garden in. So on the left is um, my food edible garden, which is a very, very small part of my yard. Um, this gets full on um, south sun. You can see on this end, um, I have herbs. So this is a, a perennial end of my garden. And then the rest of the garden is devoted to um, salad. You can see there's a couple old chards in there that I'm still harvesting from and there's parsley that I'm still harvesting from from last year, um, but uh, it's too cold to put in new stuff yet. Um, I'll probably do that this weekend. And on the right, um, you'll see the giving garden. This is um, our church garden that has 31 raised beds. Um, we're <laughs> This is like cushy gardening, guys. <laughs> um, if we have a, a workshop this summer, um, we might have one here. Um, 31 um, raised beds with individual drip lines in them um, and a uh, nice mulch in between. So it, it's a pretty much of a dream to be able to garden there. So what is a weed? Well, we all, all can um, define weeds. We might have different ideas about what is a weed or what is not. But basically a weed is a plant that is growing somewhere where you don't want it to grow. And a weed is something that can proliferate amazingly crazy. Um, yeah, and when my kids would blow dandelion seeds, I would just cringe. No, you don't want to yell at them, but you just really don't want those seeds everywhere. Um, so weeds, the downside of weeds is that they compete um, with the resources um, like sun and water and nutrients. So they're competing with your vegetable plants. So it is really, really to your baby's advantage to remove those weeds or prevent those weeds. So one really nice um, resource, oh my goodness. Oh, there it is. Um, this is the uh, Applied Ecology um, Field Guide to Weeds of the Willamette Valley. Um, I'm, I'll make sure that this gets into your, uh, the chat and into your resources. But there are some weeds that are considered invasive. Um, so you really do not want to get let those get a stronghold in your yard. Um, you don't want those seeds to, to be distributed anywhere. Um, you don't want birds and anything else to be getting in there and um, spreading those around. So um, if in doubt, um, do some research. Sometimes it's difficult to identify um, plants before they start blooming, but as soon as they start blooming and you can identify them, get them out of there. Don't let them go to seed. Oops. So uh, there are so many weeds and so little time. I love this little sign. Um, uh, we need to uh, wage war on weeds um, and it's called weed triage. So the first weeds you should get out of the garden are the ones that are going to seed. So the ones that have flowered and they're setting the seed pods and they're going to blow those poofy things all over or spring those poofy things all over. Those are the ones you want to get out as soon as possible. Um, the next layer in your triage is going to be your invasive weeds and grasses. So the things that um, can start spreading by roots, the crab grasses and other things like that, um, they're not going to immediately poof with the seeds, but they're going to cause a problem in the long run. And then everything else. So I, I did go out and take a picture uh, of a few March weeds. That springy white thing, um, you guys all know what they are. They're all over. Those little white flowers are. are diminutive and sweet, but then they make these brown, you can't really see them on here, they haven't developed those seeds yet. They make these brown skinny ends where those flowers were and you touch them and literally they will spring feet away. So you want to get rid of those um, before. So I call this weed crisis weeding. Um, I'll go around and I'll just say, we're not weeding anything else. We're doing the crisis weeding. Only get those ones with the white flowers. Just let's spend a few minutes and get those out. 
So another weed that um this one I don't oh I don't I don't try to identify weeds with Latin names and anything. I don't think they deserve that. <laughs> so nobody asked me what the names are. I don't know. I'm sure another master gardener could tell you. Um, but these are these the yellow ones um, that make those poofy balls uh, that blow around. So you want to get those out too. Well, the nice thing about weeding in your vegetable garden is you know what the vegetables are that you're planting. So everything else could be considered a weed. You know, when you inherit a flower garden from someone and the plants are coming up and you're not sure if it's a flower or a weed, then there's a lot more questions. But in your vegetable garden, you know, it's a vegetable or it's not a vegetable. <laughs> so that's one advantage, you know, um, I think it was Lynn talking about different um, ways to seed. There are advantages to seeding in bands or in rows because you put the little stake on the end and you know if these little things come up all in a row that it's probably your vegetables. Um, you'll see it in the front here, this is a compost pile. I had some really nice compost delivered last uh, summer and notice all along the edges some, uh, some weeds, again, those come up with the poofy seeds and then the dandelion kinds of things. That's lower down on the triage because I don't see any flower buds on there. So um, I, I wouldn't try to get those. Um, and then the grasses. Again, you want to keep your grasses under control because they will put out seed heads and they will put out runners and you don't want those going through your vegetable bed. So controlling weeds. Um, you can do that with water management, mowing, using transplants like Lynn talked about. If you have kind of a weedy CD bed, if you um, have well-established plants like the tomato she planted last time, um, it's gonna get a stronger start and not have to compete with the weeds because it's so much bigger to start with. Um, as Candy explained, using cover crops, it not only holds moisture in and um, can fix nitrogen and provide all the other kinds of benefits, but it also can keep the weeds out because it's out competing them. And landscape fabric is all, also a possibility. So you'll hear, see here on the left, um, this is uh, the cover crop is still growing. There's, this was a, a, a mix of three different kinds of seeds that I got. So sometimes when you're putting in cover crops quite late, like October, you're not sure if you have enough warmth in the, in the season left to get things to germinate. Um, so this has um, favas, vetch, and Austrian peas. I find that um, clover, if you wait too long into October, oct um, October is often too cold to get clover to germinate. If I'm gonna put in clover and I really want to do that, I try to do that in, in September. Um, you see also here, this um, has a drip line through this bed. So that's another um, way to control weeds. When we first started the garden in this in this giving garden, um, we didn't have fancy raised beds. So we hired a guy to come and plow the field, um, <laughs> and we had one of those kind of sprinklers. And you know, when you just have raw dirt and you plant your little vegetable seeds in there, and we water the bejeebers out of it, you get a lot of weeds. Um, it was a battle. It was a constant battle that uh, first couple years getting the weeds down. It was so hard that uh, picking bush beans, you could hardly tell where the bush beans were. There were so, so many weeds. So another strategy is to um, mulch. You'll see in the orchard here, um, all under the drip line, we have wood chips. Um, these were wood chips were put down last summer. So you can see there's a little bit of weeds poking through, but nothing like, you know, the rest of the field. The rest of the field does get mowed um, so that it minimizes the, the weed seeds that um, blow around. So the orchard is adjacent to these um, other raised beds. Um, this is a, the three bin compost system. It's for, they're pretty wide, they're about five or six feet wide. So you, we wanted to be able to have enough at the end of the season. This garden um, produces a lot of compost. Um, you can see here, in this bed, um, it was the end of the compost, it got emptied out, but you can see it's pretty weedy um, and you really don't want weed seeds in your compost. So these were probably, we, we don't normally put weeds into the compost bins, we only put vegetable matter in there. Um, the leafy vegetable matter, we don't try to put um, seedy matter in there. Um, but you can see 
um, since that wasn't covered, the weed seeds blew in and um, started growing. So we'll have to go through there. The middle bin had the bulk of our fall um, composting. And um, as we layered it, we watered it and layered it green, brown water, green, brown water. Um, and it was up over the top of the edges. And you can see how much it's decomposed because you can tell by the tarp, it's, it's really sunk in, sunken in. But by putting the tarp over there, we've um, retained the moisture in that, in that bin and we've also kept the weed seeds out. So there are a ton of options for um, weeding tools. Um, I thought I had a picture on here. I don't know what happened. Uh, I, I'm a really simple weeder. All I need is a glove and a bin and a little hand trowel, like one of these kind of hand trowels. A lot of uh, people like to use the hori horis and other things, but I have this red handled, red plastic handled trowel that um, it's my it's my constant companion. Um, and gloves. I can never have too many pairs of gloves. You want really good gloves. I prefer, if I'm gonna be hand weeding, I prefer the gloves with the, um, that thicker rubber stuff on there. They're, they're too thick for seeding or doing fine things, but um, I like the heavier gloves for weeding. Anybody else weigh in? What, what are your favorite weeding tools? Yeah, I agree with you. I like hand trowel. Um... But I also really, really like, I have this, um, this light, long-handled hoe because when I plant things um, and they're still pretty small, I can just like lightly scrape the soil around the young plants and I can cover a bigger area. Like I, there's only two of us um, gardening a pretty big garden. And so the hoe is kind of efficient for getting at stuff when it's small. So I like that. And my husband always sharpens it. He like, Ooh. like, uh, either to, you know, like runs the blade, runs the blade against the sharpening blade against it. So, um, that is very helpful. And I have a, a steak knife that I use, uh, for those long tap roots that won't come up. I just slice them four or five inches down with the <laughs> steak knife and then they come up very easily. That's good. Uh, yeah, I've I've gotten a number of tools, um, not necessarily for weeding, but from estate sales. So um, when I have more landscape plants, not so much vegetables, when they with when they're root down, uh, uh, you know the the what are those big pokey fork things that you would use on a roast? They're pretty heavy duty. I use those to loosen roots and things like that. I imagine they'd be good for. Um, working on weeds too one of my oh go one ahead of my favorite oops one of my favorite ones is the there i go one of my favorite ones is the dandelion digger because it works very well at getting the ones the deeper roots Yep, definitely. All right. And I, if, I think somebody here has got some slides for me um, to share. That would be great. Um, I'm not oh, sure. Oh, I have, to sorry. Share. I have to reshare. <laughs> Jennifer. Uh, but when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about pests really broadly um, in my garden. Like, what is the most pesky thing that I have? Um, that I have to work with. And so um, we'll talk about insects, but we'll also talk a little bit about the other things that um, could be um, problematic uh, that come up in your garden. Um, I'm kind of glad there's a, a minute um, before we start though, because um, really the things that the other folks, <laughs> the things that the other folks told you about today, um, the watering and the weeding are really closely connected to, um, to pest management because um, it's amazing if you have 
a healthy plant that has plenty of water and plenty of sunshine and plenty of air um, and you've taken the weeds away from it. It's amazing what uh, a plant can withstand. So as I feel like I, I got, I have the least important topic <laughs> of everybody here. Um, so with that, uh, pest management. So um, when you think about pests in your garden, um, we like to teach a, sort of a integrated pest management approach to thinking about your pests. So number one, um, thinking about how can you prevent the pests from coming at all? And then moving into a little bit more invasive, if they come in, you know, is there a way that you can um, remove them with like a mechanical or a physical control? And then if you can't do that, um, can you use some sort of biological control, um, which is a little more um, hands-on, a little more invasive um, and has more consequences for your garden. And finally, um, if all else fails, are there chemical controls? Um, so next slide. Uh, so with pest management, um, I think the most important thing is that you sometimes go outside in your garden and do absolutely nothing. <laughs> so one of my favorite things to, my do, to do is just to go in the morning and walk my garden. And I just like, while I'm out there, I kind of peek at the leaves and maybe poke, look under the leaves. But I, I like to like, I'm not watering, I'm not weeding, I'm just hanging out in my garden. Sometimes I'm thinking about how beautiful it is. <laughs> but by keeping an eye on things, I notice when something is off. And if I can catch things early, I can often have a way to control a problem um, before it gets out of, before it gets crazy. So, and I know what things look like. So when something's different and off, I know, um, wait, something's wrong. So checking your plants is really important. Um, and then another thing that, like another main message that we really wanted to get across to you about pests is you may not mind some of the pests. <laughs> I think in these Master Gardener talks, we sometimes make it sound like this is the way to have a perfect garden and just do this and don't do that. And what we're, we don't want to be saying to you is like your garden has to be perfect. Every plant has to be perfect. Like bugs and other pests happen. They happen to every single gardener here. Um, all the advice we give you is based on things that have happened in our garden and will happen in our garden probably this year. So um, you, can't, you might develop a tolerance for that. It might not be a bad thing to have some, uh, a few bugs. In fact, we all have a few bugs in our garden. Next slide. Um, but uh, if you do find things that um, maybe um, you don't want to be there and we will um, later uh, kind of look at what some of those things might be. Um, the, 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 um, beyond prevention and having healthy plants, um, physical controls um, are one way um, that you can um, remove pests um, or keep them away from your plants um, and uh, without um, much other consequence uh, for your garden. Next slide. And sometimes that just means picking off the bugs. <laughs> so uh, there's, uh, for me, like there are certain caterpillars or certain beetles that I know about that I might just pluck them off <laughs> and put into a jar of alcohol and, uh, or maybe uh, with the weeds into my yard debris bin. And that is the most that I do to control them. Um, but physical control also might be something a little bit stronger. So um, I have, I do actually use drip irrigation as my main irrigation uh, strategy, but there are certain uh, pests that uh, I know the best way to get rid of them is to just take that garden hose with a high pressure stream and spray 
uh, and spray the plants. So for example, my broccoli plants get a spray of water on a regular basis, even though most of my garden has drip irrigation, just because it attracts the kind of insects that can be controlled pretty well with water. Next slide. Um, but physical controls and removing pests can also apply to um, creating barriers. Um, to protect your plants. Now this curriculum was developed in Portland. And so uh, somehow um, they, don't, uh, they don't bring up fencing a lot, but I know that there are several people who, who I've talked to in this class who are going to garden um, in a rural area or maybe you're gardening in North Corvallis <laughs> and um, fencing, um, Fencing your garden may be something that you really seriously want to consider because your main pest might be deer. And if you do have deer in your area, you might be, you might consider that deer can jump over um, an eight foot, seven foot, eight foot fence. And so that eight foot, nine foot fence uh, is really what you need in order to keep the deer out. So um, it's something to consider if you're gardening in a rural area. Uh, likewise, rabbits um, will, eat your <laughs> will eat your plants and um, you can kind of create some smaller, lower fences to keep out, um, to keep out rabbits. You can use chicken wire um, to keep out rabbits. Um, I know there's people who put hardware cloth over their growing beds to keep out their cat. <laughs> Who's their, main, who's their main pest digging in their raised bed. Um, my husband and I are going to be digging out one of our raised beds this year and putting the hard, we're putting a hardware cloth under the soil because the last three years, there have been a lot, a huge explosion of voles and gophers in the valley. And uh, we can no longer grow root crops in there. So physical controls can keep out a lot of the, um, the things that uh, Crop, cause crop failure. Next slide. Um, now, biological control, um, I think, is a, a, a little more complicated, um, but is an interesting strategy. Um, so, under biological control, um, I would actually, although I would actually include um, choosing varieties that. Um, have a certain amount of resistance to um, uh, disease, uh, which I guess could be considered a pest. Um, biological control, sometimes people will, uh, will plant uh, flowers <laughs> to um, attract beneficial insects, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, a lot of the like flowers in like the the same family with carrots and parsley that have a, um, a flowering head that looks a little bit like an umbrella. A lot of those are great for attracting beneficial insects that are predators on the insects that are pests. Um, and then some people use organic um, insecticides um, like BT that are a biological control. Um, it's not a strategy that I use in my own garden. Um, but it is something that some people use um, for um, like large fields of brassicas, um, like carrots and cabbage, I mean, not carrots, like broccoli and uh, cabbage. Next slide. Ah, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot I had a slide for this. So yes, the beneficial insects. Um, I, lo <laughs> I love it when I get uh, praying mantises in my garden. They're like one of the best ever. And I, I do try to keep an eye around my fence line to see if I'm getting the, um, if I'm getting the uh, cocoons for the praying mantises. They are a great predator and um, they'll take out some insects that you don't want to be in your garden. Next slide. And then chemical control. Um, so chemical control is sometimes the first thing that, uh, that people think about um, when they see insects in their garden. They think, all right, what do I need to go get to get rid of this? Um, and there are chemicals that people use in, um, in organic, gardening. Um, 
some common ones are um, people will use uh, sluggo, uh, like which I think iron phosphate uh, in order to control slugs. Um, and that's not one that I use at all. Um, I, so I have a more biological control. Uh, so for, uh, we said we talk about slugs. This might be an okay time to talk about slugs. Um, so you could use Sluggo and I bet I would be willing to bet there are people on this call who, who do use that for control. So my control is timing. I plant late. So when I plant late, it's not as wet and there aren't as many slugs. Um, I have ducks. So the ducks run around my garden when I, it's not planted, they eat all the slug eggs up. And so I just don't have as many slugs because the slugs can't reproduce. And then when I see slugs, because someone brought up mulch and mulch in like mulch in raised beds can attract slugs. It creates these little like hiding holes that, um, and I, my experience, I don't know what other people's experience here is. My experience is that with leaf mulch, especially I um, will find slugs in there. If I do, then I go on a slug hunt and I use physical controls and I pick them out. And for me, that is enough to um, control slugs. Now, if I were to be having my garden much earlier and it was always wet, then maybe, um, maybe that's something that I would consider. Um, another um, chemical control that um, some people use for organic methods is neem oil. Neem oil um, is, um, is really, it is an insecticide. And so when you use an insecticide, it could have effects on other insects other than the ones that you were targeting. Um, it gets mixed with um, water and soap. Um, and then in between those two, I would say some people will use like a, like a safer soap, like a, a product that is basically soap and water that um, makes it um, hard for the insects get smothered by it, but it's not, um, there's not, there's not a tremendous amount of chemical in it. So um, I think the master gardeners recommend that you buy one uh, because if you mix up your own, it's possible that you get the uh, get the wrong uh, formula and you might uh, kill your plants, which is something that I have personally done. <laughs> <laughs> Too much Dr. Bronner's plus water can cause dead plants. <laughs> All right, next slide. <laughs> All right, are, you, are we ready? We're, uh, we're ready to play a game? All right, Jennifer, you're going to play with me? Sure, I don't know. You'll have to tell me what to do. Okay, can you see your chat? Can I see my chat? <laughs> yes. So this, is, so this is a game. Um, it is called Good Bug, Bad Bug. So the way that we play is I will show you all a picture of a bug. It's not necessarily going to be a real bug in the biological sense, but I'm using bug very broadly to mean all insects. And so everybody needs to get their chat open. And when I show the bug, then um, someone who's monitoring the chat can, uh, tell me, is it a good bug or is it a bad bug? Is this something that you do want in your garden or is this something that you do not want in your garden? Okay, so so our job is to say good or bad in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, Carol, and then we'll find out. And Carol will be monitoring it. Yeah, Carol, maybe Carol. Carol, can you tell me what people say, whether people are guessing good bug or bad bug? Yes, I can do that. All right. And so Jennifer and Jennifer will do the slides. All right. So let's look at the first one. Okay. All right, ladybug. Good bug or bad bug? Not lots of goods coming in here already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think ladybug is one of the favorite good bugs. So can we have the next slide? So the, I think the, many of you know that the reason that why we love to have ladybugs in our gardens is not just because they're cute, but because they're actually fabulous predators and they will eat aphids, which are one of the things that um, many of us don't want growing on, we don't want living on our plants that can cause damage to our plants. So ladybugs are something that you can attract with the with um with having flowers around and in your garden 
Um, and you can buy them and release them into your garden. But I have pretty good luck attracting them. I don't, I've never, this, this, uh, this presentation was, uh, this slide was created by Elizabeth, um, who was here on the first night. And she says she has this strategy for um, spraying with whey and yeast on the plants, which I have not tried. I don't know if anyone else here has tried it, mm -hmm. but maybe I will try it this year. So next bug. All right. Cabbage worms, good bug or bad bug? <laughs> Camouflaged is sneaky. <laughs> All right, overwhelmingly bad. I know. I think the picture gives it away if if you looked at it from this view. Now, if I had shown what this looks like um, when it is uh, when it is an adult, then you may or may not have guessed. Uh, you may or may not have guessed that it was bad um, because it is. Um, next slide. Um, it is a caterpillar of um, the cabbage white um, butterfly. So you see all those cute little white butterflies fluttering around your garden. They are going potentially um, something that's going to attack your cabbage leaves. I don't have a huge problem with them. I do pick them off if I see them. Um, and apparently, you know, because there's these butterflies landing on them, you could use a cover um, to prevent them. All right, next slide. All right, next bug. Good bug or bad bug? I'm seeing lots of good show up. <laughs> yes. Uh, hey, next Leah, slide. Just, Leah, just <laughs> a couple of questions to answer, so leave yourself enough time. Well, I may or may not know the answers, but we can work as a team. So uh, next slide. So the, the green lace wings are another one that um, are a very helpful uh, predator. Um, and again, um, you can attract them um, through planting in your yard for, of flowers. Next slide. Flea beetles. Well, everybody knows they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know there really aren't quite as many. <laughs> there aren't quite as many mysteries here. Um, but so flea beetles, um, next slide, are a challenge. Um, I went 10 years without having flea beetles in my garden. Um, they come in and they, um, they can really attack uh, tomato plants. They can attack um, collards and broccoli. Um, the nasturtiums also will get hit really hard with the flea beetles. And so hopefully maybe take some of the pressure um, off of the flea beetles. Um, but they're often something that's not something that you did personally. They are something that often will hit like the whole area at once. Mm -hmm. Next slide. All right, centipede. Good bug or bad bug? Oh, it looks like they're good. Yeah. All right, next slide. Yes, I think so. Although <laughs> they are a reason to wear your garden gloves. <laughs> uh, so it's not, we're not saying don't be careful about them, but they really do um, help you to build um, the healthy soil that you're trying to build. So you'll often find them in your compost pile. Next slide. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is gross. Slugs? That, really that picture. That's well, those, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Elizabeth's slugs really are having a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is beer so we, already, we already <laughs> talked about slugs being a problem for so many people here. Um, I, she, I, she has that picture. Some of you may have tried the old trick of trapping slugs in beer. And I, I, I although I told you I do, about my main slug control strategies, I have, I have pulled out the container of beer um, before to attract them in a pinch. All right. Um, the one other, oh. oops, sorry. <laughs> the one other thing I'd say is that, um, that was on that slide is that they do see slugs really do like to kind of hide in um, 
hide underneath boards. And so I do think that's kind of an interesting strategy to catch them is to put out a hiding place for them and then turn it over and pick them out. That way uh, you can find them. All right, next slide. All right, and aphids. Um, aphids are an interesting creature. Uh, they, uh, they're kind of soft bodied and they, uh, they unfortunately like, uh, they suck, I don't know what, the, I don't, I'm not being articulate. <laughs> they're, uh, they are, they make the, yeah, I'm not being able to art, be articulate about aphids, um, but there are more than one kind of aphid. And so next slide for me, um, I like to use different strategies for different types of aphids. So the ones that were just in those pictures, those gray aphids that, um, that come into broccolis and kales and cabbage. Um, I find that if you spray them down with water, that that is um, very helpful. And also they're seasonal. So they might come into your um, garden and be on your kale in August, but after the freeze, um, they've died off and you have healthy kale. So I um, have a tolerance for them and I um, will wash them off the vegetables. If, if there's another kind of aphid that are small and green that um, are on tomato plants, and I, that is something that I keep a very close eye on when I bring starts into my garden. I look under the leaves to make sure that there aren't um, small green aphids on them. And if there are, I make sure that I brush them off or maybe use a little bit of a very dilute um, soap on the plants um, so that all of my young growing plants don't get eaten by them. Um, I don't worry about them so much once the plants get bigger. Next slide. All right. We can think of so we have one or two more. Good bug or bad bug? I think this, uh, we're seeing a couple of bads here so far. All right, let's see. So this is another one of the tricky ones, right? This is a, this was another one of the predators. Um, so I think our point in um, going through these is just that um, you don't always know. And so um, it's fun to try to look up if you see an insect on your plant, it's fun to look it up, but the master gardeners are really a fantastic resource um, for helping you sort through what is really going on with your plants. Um, so if you do have something on your plants and your plants look very unhappy, then um, the master gardeners are really a great resource to help you sort out. Is it something you do want to have or something that you don't want to have around your garden? All right, next slide. Good bug or bad bug, cucumber beetle. One person has ventured a bad. <laughs> Yep, I see a couple. All right, next slide. There's some more. Yes, this is definitely something that if you are growing cucumbers, you probably want to keep your eyes open and are pretty easy to just pick off and remove with a manual control. Next slide. Leaf miners, good bug or bad bug? Next slide. Bad's rolling in. <laughs> I know it's like you would not want your plants to look like that um, so leaf miners are very easy to get in your chard and your beets um, but you might develop a tolerance like it might not be that you have that many you might have some pretty leaves and some not pretty leaves you could pick those bad leaves off um, or if it's something that really bothers you you might be able to cover up your beets and your chard when they're young um, just so that um, so that uh, they don't have eggs laid onto them. Uh, next slide. And questions. Um, there was a question about, um, back a bit, um, what bugs could be eating seeds or just germinated plants? Mm. That, so lots of things could be eating seeds or just germinated plants. So um, it could be, it could be a bug. It could be a mouse, <laughs> uh, you know, 
I, I my friend, one of my good friends has a mouse in her greenhouse and she's been mm. gardening for years and it's driving her crazy. <laughs> um, it could be ants taking away your seeds, collecting the seeds. It's a little early for ants, but I certainly have had that happen. Um, I've also had ants bring aphids into my greenhouse. So um, sometimes the aphid control in my greenhouse is actually the same as controlling sugar ants in my house with a little bit of borax. Um, and then there are also um, some of the decomposing, um, some of the decomposing, so sometimes slugs will eat your early plants if, you, if they're outside or even in a wet, out in a wet greenhouse. Um, and then something else that um, is around here in the Willamette Valley in the soil is called like a symphalin. And I didn't have a picture of that one, um, but they often like eat the roots um, of young plants coming up. So that's birds some can... things I thought of. Maybe some other folks have other ideas. Well, I was going to say birds can... Birds can get seeds too. <laughs> um, they're not insects, but they still do like to snag those seeds sometimes. I had to plant beans three times last year because the crows kept coming back. I ended up having to put um, the chicken wirey stuff over them because, yeah, the, the crows they, were terrible. They so, hear, Jennifer, we had to do that too. Corn, corn and beans, both. But it's kind of like, you know, how we. <laughs> it's squirrels. Squirrels it's are terrible. Yeah. I guess if I could have one message though, you know, it's kind of like we teach the kids to be resilient. Like, you know, you're going to plant some things that don't come up and then, and then you're going to look at your, your list and say, is it too late to plant? And if you really want the, the thing, maybe you'll plant again. <laughs> and if they don't, and if that, if that doesn't work, maybe you'll go out and buy some starts. <laughs> You know, like I think like you you can expect multiple failures in your garden yeah. before something goes right and that's just normal for all of us another question that came up was when to use nematodes hmm. I don't use nematodes does anyone else here use them uh, I've only used them once and it was for rhododendrons they were they were some kind of weevil that was notching the edges um, but I've not used nematodes in the vegetable garden Maybe we can capture that in the chat, Carol, mm -hmm. and we can look no. that up. Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be a good. Yeah. that would be a good one to get back to people with. And it, it sounds like we would be helpful to maybe send some other identification options for for um, bugs and such, because there's some other discussion in about cutworms and black soldier fly larvae and things like that. So we'll catch, right. catch that too. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carol. So. Uh, if you'll notice, um, we do keep track of the chats that go through. Last uh, week, we had a lot of questions on fertilizing and planting um, that we were not able to get to. So uh, I did send the links this week uh, to the answered questions. So both Sue and Lynn took time to answer your questions. And so if you look that up at either in the participants folder or in the email that I sent, there's a link um, to that folder. Um, so you can see answers to the questions that came up in the chat. And then if, if there were any references um, and links, I included that in that information as well. So in that participants folder, you'll find all kinds of information, the participants guide in English and Spanish and uh, the chats. And hopefully we will get the videos on there. We're um, having to do a bit of editing that takes longer than we had anticipated. But once this, um, these sessions are done, you can go back through and watch videos if there's parts that you want to review. Or if you want to share them with other people, that's totally awesome. So we are bumped up um, one minute past eight. But before we leave, I wanted to let you know what was happening uh, next week. Um, we will have an, a different kind of session. We're going to be talking about what kind of sources are out there for um, free and cheap materials and for sharing um, and bring your own ideas because we have a lot of wealth of gardening experience here in the area. So um, if you know of sources of, of places to get things like compost, um, be sure to share that. 
Um, we'll also talk about using your bounty or using locally grown produce in simple recipes. And uh oh, somehow my homework slide did not get on here. Um, along with sharing our, your sharing the recipes, which Cynthia will do next week, or next, uh, not next week, Thursday, she will be sharing that. We want you to share your recipes as well. Somehow my uh, my uh, my link did not make it in there. There is a folder, that same Google Drive folder in the, the participant folder. You can upload your uh, recipes in there. And I've already put one in. So if you want to profoundly change the way your soups taste, try making your own vegetable broth from scraps. So I got this um, recipe, quote, quote, recipe from Carol Walsh. Um, a couple years ago, and um, yeah, my soups are so much better and amazing and unlovely because I'm using this free thing called vegetable scraps. The, the compost pile eventually gets it. Um, but um, most importantly, we will have an open Q and A session next week on um, next session on Thursday. So we'll have a good long chunk of time. You can bring any questions there. Um, hopefully we'll be able to answer most of them, but again, if we're not able to answer them on the spot, we will update them in um, your resources in a follow-up email. We will also have a poll at the end of next session um, asking you about what kinds of um, follow-up you would like, whether it's um, open Q&A periodically throughout the growing season or workshops if we're able to meet in person. So um, at the end, and if you have any ideas um, we certainly yeah. would welcome your ideas. So thank you again for joining us in this third session of Seed to Supper, and we will see you on Thursday evening for our last session.